So what I will do um, for the next uh, few minutes uh, is to talk about monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance and small ring multiple myeloma. Now, how many of um, you in the room with the diagnosis of myeloma had a diagnosis of muggers or small ring before they got the myeloma diagnosis? All right, so I see at least four. Um, so at least four that we knew of, right? We know everybody has had a muggers or small ring before they get myeloma. It's just that we don't recognize it. And when you think about uh, this whole spectrum of diseases, um, you know, we talked about how the monoclonal protein and the plasma cells in the bone marrow are a couple of the key features for this entire group of diseases or disorders. The most common condition in, is a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And as we'll show later, a, only a small fraction of these patients will this kind of progress over time uh, to active myeloma that needs treatment. And some people can have a phase that is in between that is often referred to as a small ring multiple myeloma. It's kind of a gray zone where we are not quite sure if it's, you know, it, it, it hasn't quite reached the point where we need to do any treatment, but we know it's kind of gone past the stage of a mugus or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And what happens during this time is obviously there's increasing amounts of the, uh, the monoclonal protein and also the proportion of uh, myeloma cells or the plasma cells in the bone marrow continues to increase. Now, when you think about the, as I said, the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance is the most common. Uh, there have been some studies where we have kind of looked at systematically at everybody in a given geographical location and tested their blood to see how many patients or how many people actually have a monoclonal protein. Now, if you just look at this blue line, that is what you would actually diagnose in the clinic. This orange or the yellow line on the top shows actually what is out there in the community based on what the studies that have been done. So you can see that only about a third or fewer of these patients or people with a monoclonal protein actually get diagnosed as a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. And the other thing I wanted to point out again too is that you know, as uh, folks get older, the more and more people will have a monoclonal protein in their uh, blood or urine. Now, we don't, know, we don't know all the reasons why people get a monoclonal gammopathy. Why do those plasma cells go crazy, so to speak? Um, but we do have some clues from the studies that have been done. We know there's certainly a, um, dif a racial difference. There's clearly a higher risk in African-American um, population compared to Caucasians, and it's lower in the Asian population compared to the Caucasian population. So clearly some, uh, some genetic risk factors there. We know that exposure to certain chemicals, especially petroleum products or exposure to radiation, do increase the risk of uh, developing this group of disorders. And there is also an increased risk that runs in the families. Now, obviously, this, even though um, you know, there's a risk running in the families, we know that first-degree relatives of people who have a monoclonal gammopathy or a related cancer have two to three-fold higher risk of getting something similar. But considering how rare these conditions are, even the twofold risk doesn't necessarily translate to a huge number. And that is the reason why we, don't, we never recommend family members to get screened for this protein just because somebody has myeloma. So this is, again, the same uh, thing I just talked about. This shows you, um, you know, how um, the, the dotted line here is what you would expect in a population, and this is what you would expect in a, um, some, in, in a person who has a rel first degree relative with um, myeloma or mugus. And you can see that the risk, again, continues to increase with age as well. Now, this is what I was alluding to before, that everybody with myeloma has had mugus for some time. You know, we, that protein doesn't show up overnight. So that is, you know, you kind of expect that to be the case. But there are studies which gives you a sense of how long it's kind of, you know, how long does it take for somebody to go from that muggers to a myeloma phase? Now, this was a study that was done where basically we uh, identified, you know, this PLCO study is a cancer screening study that was done by the um, NIH um, with 77,000 uh, old patients or people who were followed over time. And Ident they identified 71 people who had myeloma, then went back and looked at the samples that were stored over years, and found that the vast majority of the people had a monoclonal protein or an M protein up to at least eight years prior to their diagnosis of myeloma. 
And when you, when you kind of extrapolate or use mathematical models, what we think is that in most patients, um, the, the M protein or the M spike probably starts somewhere in the 30s or 40s. And it, we think on an average it takes about 15 years for them to go from that beginning of muggers to an active myeloma. Again, these are average numbers. Obviously, there can be differences between people. But I think the, the main point here is that there is a huge window of opportunity where we could really be doing something different. Obviously, we need to continue to understand what that different could be, and do we do that for everyone, or do we select some people in whom the risk is much higher? So, which then brings up, to the, brings up the question of what is the risk of getting myeloma if you have a Muggers or a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Now, this line here, this is work done by Dr. Kyle uh, over decades, and what he was able to find out was two things. One, if you have monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, your risk of getting myeloma next year or within the next year is 1%. So if you look at 100 people with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, one out of that 100 will get myeloma each year as you go along. Now, if you have had it for 10 years, your risk of getting it in the 11th year is still 1%. So that risk doesn't go up or go down necessarily. So we, we think it's, you know, it's a steady risk that never goes away. So it's very important for us to continue to watch patients who have monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance in a, on a regular basis. So how can we identify the people who are more likely to get uh, myeloma? Now, obviously, there are a lot of different things that have been described, and there are models that have been developed that can identify uh, people with a higher risk, but there's no, nothing that can definitively tell a person, you are going to get myeloma, you are not going to get myeloma. It's all a question of increasing or decreasing odds of that happening. So one is the, the, the more the protein or the higher the level of pro M protein you have, higher the risk. If you have an IgG type of monoclonal protein, you have a lower risk than if you have an IgA type. If you have that free light chains we talked about, if you have a significantly imbalanced ratio, so significantly higher kappa compared to lambda or vice versa, then you have a higher risk of developing uh, myeloma. And then there are other things that have been described too, and I won't go into uh, detail of, details of that. So, now let's just kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about that intermediate phase of smoldering multiple myeloma. As I said, you know, if you're watching somebody with muggers closely over years, you probably can observe uh, more, you know, observe that person going through a phase sometimes through a smoldering and getting, you know, myeloma that needs treatment. But the vast majority of the patients who get diagnosed with smoldering myeloma has a monoclonal protein that is picked up as part of other uh, testing that is done. So patients could come in uh, for some totally unrelated symptoms, and you, as part of your workups, you do a M protein study, you find there's an M protein, then the first question you do, or first set of workup you do is to see, is it somebody with a muggers, is it somebody with a smoldering myeloma, or is it an active myeloma that needs treatment? So the smoldering myeloma, it's, it's only a um, dig, you know, difference in terms of the degree or the amount of um, the M protein and the plasma cells, um, at least when you, you know, do the testing in the clinic. So again, just like the muggers, patients with smoldering myeloma are asymptomatic. These myeloma cells are not doing anything bad to them at this point. Um, what is different compared to the monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance is now your M spike is more than or equal to three grams. If it's less, then it kind of fits into that box of, box of muggers. Or you have more than 500 milligrams in a 24-hour urine collection. Um, or you have bone marrow has 10 to 60 percent plasma cells. Now the 10 to 60 percent, less than 10, it's more of muggers. More than 60 or, 60 or more, it's myeloma that needs treatment. So in between is what we call the smoldering myeloma. And obviously, there should not be any of these uh, risk factors um, or any of these um, what we call the end organ damage, the bone disease or the renal disease uh, should not be there. Now, one of the critical difference between a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance and smoldering myeloma is the risk of, the, of it developing or progressing to multiple myeloma. Now, we saw this line before. It's like that one person per year of patients with muggers getting myeloma. But when you look at the patients with smoldering myeloma, it's a totally different story. So it, as I try to explain this curve to you, so what it tells us is in five years, half of the patients who were given a diagnosis of smoldering myeloma have developed myeloma that needed treatment. 
So that's, it's a pretty steep curve here. Now, if you continue to follow the remaining patients, you know that about 15% of them will get myeloma in the next five years. But once these patients are beyond 10 years, these two lines are almost similar in the sense that it's about 1% per year. So what this curve, the comparison of these two kind of risk of progression tells us is that smoldering is really a mix of patients with muggers and myeloma, except that we don't quite have the techniques or the technology to say who have kind of gone over that threshold versus who is still continuing to be a, you know, behaving like a muggers. So we just let time tell us. But you know, with technology getting better, we should be able to do better. And we'll talk about some of those different ways that we can identify the people who are at highest risk so that we can talk about either doing something you know, to prevent the progression, which is where the field is moving towards. Now, this is again just showing how we can use different characteristics to predict the risk of progression. So if you have a protein that is IgA type of protein, and you have more than three uh, grams of the protein, and you have more than 10% uh, plus, sorry, if you have um, um, a free light chain ratio that's um, more than eight, um, and also an IgA type, and more than 10% uh, plasma cells, you can see that you have a three out of four people with those three characteristics will actually get myeloma in the first five years. So instead of having a 50% risk for everyone, you can look at a group of people with a much higher risk. Now, these are the kind of model systems that we are trying to develop to see, can we, with high degree of specificity, can we tell the patient that you have you know, an X percent of risk of getting this in the next four or five years? And the reason why we are doing that is, if we can identify somebody at very, very high risk of getting myeloma, then maybe we don't need to wait for starting treatment, which is what happened with that new definition of myeloma. So we looked at the bone marrow plasma cell percentage more than 60. We knew that those people had a 80% risk of getting myeloma in the next two years. So instead of waiting for something bad to happen, we just go ahead and start treating them. So we are hoping that over time we can identify more and more of those characteristics or features which is going to tell you that this particular person has an 80 to 90% risk of getting myeloma in the next one or two years, then we are not going to wait for the bad things to happen. So essentially, you know, what is happening is there's, you know, you start with these plasma cells um, that have kind of got, gone wrong, and over time, I, what we all believe is they get acquire more and more of the cancerous type of a characteristic, and eventually they completely replace um, the, the cells that we started with, and that's kind of when we start getting these symptoms. And obviously, this, the, what is around the, these myeloma cells also undergo change over time and facilitate this transition. So, um, so just as I said, again, we already talked about some of these genomic changes or the chromosomal changes that can happen in these myeloma cells or the plasma cells. We know that the same changes that we see in myeloma is also present in patients with smoldering myeloma. So the translocations, the trisomies, the 17p deletion, all those changes that we talked about exist also in the smoldering myeloma patients, but the frequency with which you see those abnormalities may be slightly different. So while this transition happens, in addition to these, patients can get additional mutations that uh, Dr. Bergsagel talked about. Um, those things can also contribute to that switch that happens, in addition to changes that happens in the surrounding or the neighborhood of these uh, myeloma cells. So um, we already, you already heard about the clonal evolution. I won't talk about it much more. Um, but again, what it's, it's what is happening in myeloma when your newly diagnosed myeloma becoming relapsed and refractory myeloma. We know that there are changes that are happening in the genes. There are more mutations. And we believe the same thing is also happening between uh, a smoldering myeloma and uh, multiple myeloma. So. Um, Dr. Bersagel can speak more to this, but one of the things that, have been, that he has been working on for years has been this protein called MYC, and he's shown that changes that lead to an increase uh, of the levels of that MYC can also be a contributor to um, the risk of progression. So then it comes to the question of, can we actually do something different? You know, let's say we identify all these people who are at the highest risk of getting myeloma, then you know, we have to be able to do something with that information. So the Spanish group did a clinical trial where they looked at the people with the highest risk of getting myeloma or progressing to myeloma and did a trial where they gave, just watched them, which is what we do nowadays in the clinic, or gave them treatment with the lenalidomide or ravlamide and dexamethasone. 
And what they were able to find was that if you gave patients um, the Ravlamid and the dexamethasone, your risk of getting active myeloma is um, much less compared to the people who are not being treated. And you could argue that you would have expected that because you are giving them a treatment that works. But what was more important was that by starting treatment earlier in these high-risk patients, they were able to actually um, increase the overall survival of these patients. So these patients were able to live longer, which is what we want to show by, you know, we don't want to intervene early and not be able to uh, make people live longer because obviously all these treatments come with some side effects too. So this is an example of, you know, there are a lot of different trials ongoing. This is an example of a trial that is uh, going to be opening up fairly soon. And the whole concept is, can we actually treat patients with very high risk smoldering myeloma with very intense type of therapy that we use for myeloma? So you're going to use carfilzomib, uh, lenalidomide, or ravlamid, dratimumab, which is the monoclonal antibody you just heard about. So four drugs, give it for four cycles, People can either get a transplant or they can get four more cycles, yet another four cycles, so one year's worth of therapy, and then another one year of reduced doses of the same drug. So you're going to give two years of fairly intense treatment, but then they're going to stop there. No prolonged therapy. But by doing that, can you actually cure the disease is the first question. Even if you can cure the disease, is it possible that they won't need treatment for myeloma for the next five or ten years? So those are the kind of uh, clinical trials that are currently being planned. So, um, so I think that's what we're going to be looking at for the future. We, I think uh, there are some patients with muggers with very, very low risk of progression. And I think we need to be able to reassure them and don't worry, forget, uh, stop worrying about those people. Uh, the muggers who have, still have an increased risk of progression whom we need to watch closely. Patients with smoldering myeloma where we can do trials where to see if we can slow down the progression. And patients who have already kind of, they may not have become symptomatic, but they have very high likelihood of getting those whom we should treat like myeloma. And then obviously the myeloma patients whom we treat today. So I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you.